Welcome back to Mad Medicine. In this lecture, we're going to be discussing the preferred medications for psychiatric conditions. Now, we're not really going to be discussing the psych conditions in depth. If you guys want to watch videos about all of these psych conditions, I highly recommend you guys go to our YouTube channel, YouTube forward slash Mad Medicine, where we have playlists for step one uh, for a whole psychiatry playlist. So go check that out, as well as a whole pharmacology playlist where we're going to talk about these uh, psych medications in depth. Today, honestly, it's going to be a high yield review session of the medications you should use to treat certain psych conditions. Now, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to our channel because we're going to be posting new videos practically every single day for you guys as far as step one is concerned. So let's get started. Let's start talking about ADHD, attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder, and the medications you are going to use to treat this disorder. Mainly, the first sign medications are going to be stimulants. Then these stimulants include methylphenidate, a.k.a. Ritalin, you're going to have amphetamine, a.k.a. Adderall, and you're going to have dexmethylphenidate, a.k.a. Focalin. These are your three main medications you use to treat ADHD. Now, I know you guys have heard of this because you guys went through college or are in college, and uh, you definitely have heard of people using Adderall and Ritalin to help them study. The reason why uh, we prescribe these medications is that we know these drugs are going to block the reuptake of dopamine and serotonin. The two main neurotransmitters you need to understand uh, are affected when it comes to ADHD. And there is some evidence that suggests amphetamines might actually increase the release of these CNS hormones. So easy way to remember is think about what happens when you drink coffee. When you drink caffeine, you're going to have uh, increase in dopamine and serotonin levels. And therefore, it's very similar to stimulants because they both do the same thing when you're trying to study. That's how I always remembered it. Now, these stimulants are going to have some adverse effects like loss of appetite, which can be beneficial if a person, person is overweight. Uh, and this can lead to loss, weight loss in general because they're not going to eat as much. Because you are taking a stimulant, these patients may present with insomnia. They may complain about insomnia. That makes sense. Think about sleeping after you drink a cup of coffee. Nearly impossible for some of us. And then finally, because these are stimulants, they have a high abuse potential. I'm going to circle that so you guys don't forget. This is pretty high yield. A patient might present on the step one or in real life who might want uh, some ADHD meds only to help them study. They may not even have ADHD and therefore this is a sign of abuse. So just keep them in the back of your mind. Now, when it comes to alcohol abuse, there are three FDA-approved medications. The first sign drug is going to be naltrexone. Naltrexone is a long-acting opioid antagonist, and this drug is going to antagonize the mu opioid receptor. That's what it mainly does. So we're going to draw a little square around that for you guys so you guys can remember. It's going to antagonize the mu opioid receptor. And this is going to end up reducing the positive reinforcement of uh, alcohol as well as the craving. So this is your first line medication, okay? So that's the main thing you're going to treat for alcohol abuse. Don't get that mixed up with anything else. This is specifically for patients who are chronic, not chronic, but who are alcoholics in general. And they want to stop drinking as much as they do. You can also give a drug called a camprosate. A camprosate's mechanism is not completely understood, but what we do think is that it has uh, the ability to reduce the positive reinforcements and suppress the cravings as well. And then finally, the last drug you need to be well aware of, and I think this is the second drug that's more high yield um, after naltrexone, is going to be the drug called disulfiram. Disulfiram is going to inhibit aldehyde dehydrogenase, which is important in the breakdown of ethanol. Now, ethanol is the main alcoholic product, right? So what ends up happening is at the end of the day, patients are going to eat disulfiram before they go out, if they go out. And if they go out and they start drinking and they get drunk, they're going to wake up to having the worst hangover ever. So what you're essentially doing is positive punishment, right? Because you are adding... Uh, this stimulus, aka the worst hangover ever, to reduce their intake of alcohol. That's the main thing that you're doing. So this is a form of positive punishment. This is also for long-term therapy for alcohol abuse, okay? This is not first sign. This is more so for maintenance. Disulfiram for maintenance, naltrexone for long-term. 
So that's alcohol abuse. When it comes to alcohol withdrawal medications, uh, there are definitely certain medications you need to know. Alcohol withdrawal is going to occur 6 to 24 hours after the last ingestion in heavy drinkers. And we're going to see symptoms of patients having tremors with their mental status being intact. That's very important because their mental status is going to deteriorate uh, at the end of alcohol withdrawal symptoms if they if it's not treated properly. If you don't treat alcohol withdrawal early, you're going to go into something called delirium tremens, okay? DTs. Now, obviously the name gives it away, the delirium portion. In that stage, their mental status is not going to be intact. So, initially if their mental status is intact and they have tremors, they're also going to present with anxiety, insomnia, just some non-specific GI symptoms like nausea and vomiting as well as headaches, sweating, and palpitations. Now, you want to prevent progression to DT, so you're going to use a first-line drug known as uh, benzodiazepines, like chlorodiazepoxide, lorazepam, and diazepam. I think about PAM from the office when it comes to these drugs for benzos. Now, uh, you want to give benzos if the withdrawal symptoms are very severe. So if their tremors are happening severe, they have severe tremors, if they're really anxious, they can't sleep at all, they're throwing up and vomiting everywhere, then you definitely want to give them benzos. This is going to improve the agitation and the, prevent the pro, uh, progression of the withdrawal to DTs, okay, so delirium tremens. And uh, obviously it's going to prevent agitation because benzos are a... Uh, seen as depressant. Now, this is going to give the same effect as alcohol without the cognitive impairment. That's very important because if you give uh, barbiturates, the other class of CNS depressants that we've talked about previously, you are going to have cognitive impairment. They can lead to sedation in patients who also drink. And as you guys may know, you're never supposed to drink barbs and al you're never supposed to drink alcohol with barbiturates because then you're going to end up like Marilyn Monroe dead. So that's what you're going to use for first line treatment in alcohol withdrawal. When it comes to bipolar medications, uh, the symptoms of bipolar medication consist of mania and depression, right? And these symptoms can fluctuate rap rapidly. And I remember, I think about, uh, uh, what's his face? Kanye West, Yeezy, there you go. I think about Yeezy when it comes to bipolar mania, bipolar depression, right? Because he, he, I think he said it at one point that he does have bipolar disorder. So that's definitely a perfect example of someone who has bipolar mania. The first line treatment for these patients is going to be lithium. Lithium. Now that we don't really know the mechanism of action for this, it's thought to inhibit the phosphoinositol ca cascade by inhibiting inositol monophosphatase leading to a decrease in IP3. But the one thing you need to know is that lithium is going to decrease right, it's going to decrease the manic episodes, okay, so if someone is going through mania, it'll treat that mania, as well as decrease manic episodes, so it's good for maintenance, and it's also good for uh, acute therapy, now there are many toxic side effects of lithium therapy that you should be aware of, now we've talked about this in the lithium video, stuff like nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, patients can present with a thyrotoxicity and hypothyroidism, as well as in fetuses, you may have uh, Epstein's anomaly. Now, if lithium is not the drug you want to use, for example, if you have a patient who uh, is pregnant, you can move to mood stabilizers like valproic acid, carbamazepine, and lamotrigine, assuming that uh, there are no side effects that are going to be caused based off of these drugs. And you can also use the atypical antipsychotics, uh, the second generation antipsychotics to treat bipolar disorder. Now, when it comes to depressive disorder, the first sign drug, and you know, this is one of the drugs that's used a lot, a lot, and you're going to see this drug come up even more the more the deeper we go into this lecture. The first sign drug is going to be SSRI, selective ser serotonin reuptake inhibitors like fluoxetine, uh, fluvoxamine, peroxetine, sertraline, etc., etc. Now, when it comes to the mechanism of action, these drugs are going to inhibit the reuptake of the 5-hydroxytryptamine, aka serotonin, in the synapses, which is going to lead to increased levels of, of serotonin in the synapse. One thing to understand is that these drugs are going to take four to eight weeks to work. So if a patient comes back two weeks after you prescribe SSRIs and they complain that they haven't done anything, it's normal. You need to have that patient continue taking their meds for at least two to six more weeks so that they can start to experience uh, the positive symptoms of SSRIs. SSRI treatment. If SSRIs don't work, you can also give SNRIs like venlafaxine, duloxetine. Uh, you can also give atypical antidepressants like mirtazapine and bupropion. 
can also be considered. Eating disorders are a sort of mental disorders that are defined by abnormal eating habits, and they're usually going to affect the person's life and the physical and mental health, and they usually occur in young adolescents or in young adulthood, more common in females than it is in males. Now, to treat anorexia nervosa, you want to give glucose, and usually these eating disorders occur with another you know, issue that's happening. So you could give uh, SSRIs in this case as well if they have underlying depression. For bulimia, you definitely want to give SSRIs. Same with binge eating disorder because you know they have, a, they have usually normal amounts of weight or excessive weight in both of these. And for pica, you want to make sure you rehabilitate the patients with nutrient rehabilitation because it is a sign of uh, under malnourishment. But you can also give SSRIs to treat pica. For generalized anxiety, uh, this is going to be anxiety. It's not a proportional to the stressors that they're feeling, and it's going to be unrelated to something like a trigger specifically. It's going to be unrelated to a certain event or person, and it's going it has to last greater than six months. Okay, if it's less than six months, you can classify it as acute stress disorder. Now, the first line drug for this also is going to be SSRIs, and you can also give SNRIs as well as a drug known as buspirone. Buspirone stimulates the serotonin 1A receptors, and uh, this is going to be more so second or third line. So this is going to be second slash third line medications. This drug also, SSRIs are first line. In panic disorder, patients have recurrent episodes of uh, panic attacks that are due to an unknown trigger. Kind of like this right here. Sheldon's having a panic attack. Now, these periods are going to be of intense fear and discomfort that peak in about 10 minutes and then they go away. They present very similar to a heart attack, but you'll know that it's a panic attack because all their EKG readings and everything is going to be normal. They're just having a psychological attack of, you know, fear. Now, the first line drug, again, is going to be SSRIs. Beautiful, right? SSRIs are more likely going to be the answer you can put and get the answer right. So SSRIs, you can also use SNRIs like venlafaxine and benzodiazepines in acute settings if it's not manageable. If the patient is very, very stressed out and is having very agitating results you, uh, or effects or side effects, you definitely want to make sure you can give them some benzos to calm them down and kind of depress their CNS state. PTSD is a mental health condition that occurs after significant traumatic effect. It could be sexual abuse, it could be violence, gang wars, even homelessness can lead to PTSD because a lot of those patients have to, you know, fight to live. There are people who want to hurt them and there are, you know, other homeless people who want to hurt each other. So it's definitely a form of PTSD. And patients who have PTSD have recurrent thoughts and nightmares and flashbacks of the traumatic event or events that cause them to have PTSD. The clinical symptoms are pretty much summarized by the word hard. So they're going to be hyper aroused. They're going to avoid their stimuli. They're going to have recurrence of the traumatic effect event. Sorry, uh, And they're also going to be in, in very uh, uh, significant distress. To treat PTSD, I'm sure you can guess what the, what the drug is going to be. It's going to be SSRIs. Again, SSRIs. So we're on a roll. For the past, uh, I think, three or four, one, two, three, four, for the past four disorders, we have been treating uh, them with the first line drug as SSRIs. Second line, you can use venlafaxine, which is an SNRI. Now we're going to talk about schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is a chronic mental disorder where patients have psychosis, uh, disturbed behavior and thought, and they're going to have a decline in function. Now, these are going to be uh, pres- these patients are going to present with recurrent episodes of psychosis, where they're going to have a loss of perception to reality. Now, when you're treating uh, uh, schizophrenia, you want to use atypical, aka second generation antipsychotics. These are going to be drugs like aripiprazole, the apines, right, like clozapine, olanzapine, quetiapine, and the idones, like zyprazidone, risperidone, etc. So these are the drugs you want to use to treat schizophrenia. The reason why is because these drugs are going to treat schizophrenia as positive and negative symptoms, and they're, the defining feature is you're going to have less neurologic symptoms and more metabolic symptoms with these drugs, which is great because it's easier to treat a patient who's going to be more overweight than a patient who's having Parkinson-like uh, side effects, right? 
it's easier and it's less harmful. One thing to understand, the drug clozapine has uh, a, one negative side effect like uh, that you will most likely be tested on while you're studying, and, cl and that is a granulocytosis and neutropenia. Okay, so you definitely want to remember that a, a clozapine can lead to a depressed uh, white blood white blood cell count, and that can lead to an increased rate of infection and a lot of other things. So keep that in mind. It's a very strong drug. The clozapine drug is not the first line antipsychotic, atypical antipsychotic. It's it's pretty far down the rank. So this is going to be a very very strong drug. It's usually going to be given for treatment resistant schizophrenia. Social anxiety disorder is characterized by patients having persistent anxiety due to a phobia, uh, and this phobia leads to an exaggerated fear of embarrassing uh, situations like social situations, public speaking, etc. The phobia must last greater than six months. They may have recurrent episodes of psychosis uh, associated with this phobia, and the first sign drug for this is going to be our favorite drug, SSRIs. Amazing, amazing drug so far. Because SSRIs are leading uh, all the other drugs in what we use for treat me, treating psychotic symptoms or psychotic uh, situations. Not psychotic, I'm sorry. SSRIs are leading uh, all the other drugs when it comes to treating our psychiatric conditions. There you go. Now, you can also use venlafaxine, which is an SSRI, SNRI, excuse me, and for perform performance type issues, you can give beta blockers and benzodiazepines as a way to suppress their, their anxiety in general so that they can work and function properly. And finally, for the last psychiatric condition, Tourette syndrome, we're going to be talking about these meds. Tourette syndrome is a disorder that involves repetitive movements and unwanted sounds that can't be easily controlled. Now, this is usually going to show up around 2 to 15 years old, with the average age being around 6 years of age. And Tourette's is more common in males than it is in females, so just keep that in the back of your mind. The hallmark for this disease, or for this, for this syndrome, is going to be recurrent motor and, 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 and verbal tics. Because if they only have motor or verbal tics, just one or the other, it's going to be classified as chronic tic disorder and not Tourette's. So keep that in the back of your mind. The first line treatment for this is unfortunately not SSRIs. It's going to be antipsychotics. So antipsychotics are also in uh, in the running right now, folks. So the antipsychotics that you're going to use are going to be flufenazine, which is a high-potency first-generation antipsychotic, as well as risperidone. So watch out for flufenazine because as a high-potency first-gen antipsychotics, you could have a higher risk for EPS slash neurologic symptoms, okay? So just keep them in the back of your mind. You're going to have a lower risk for a second gen like risperidone. You can also use a drug known as tetrabenzamine, benazine, sorry, tetrabenazine, which causes dopamine depletion by activating the VMAT2 receptors, and it blocks the uptake of dopamine in the presynaptic neurons, causing less dopamine to be stored and more of it uh, to be located in the synaptic cleft. So that is all of the psychiatric conditions that we are going to talk about today along with their associated first line and you know uh, preferred medications that we use to treat these psych conditions. You need to know all this for step one. So I highly recommend you guys not only go through the psych conditions in general, right, in depth and uh, get an understanding of what happens in these conditions. But I also recommend you guys to go through the pharmacology and the, uh, the pharmacokinetics and dynamics of these drugs that are used to treat these patients. And we've been through all of that. Uh, we've gone through all of it on all of our, our videos for our step one study guide. So you can go to our channel and just watch the playlists and the corresponding videos to the psych conditions and the drugs. Now, with that being said, uh, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. You can also follow us on our social media accounts over here. And if you guys don't know, you can find these lectures these uh, on your favorite podcast providing service for free. Just search Mad Medicine and we'll pop up and you can listen to us on the go. So go ahead and continue on to the next lecture, folks. Thank you so much for listening.